Good evening. I'm David Levine. I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. In the background, as always, is Joe Bonner, who's the, my, my co-chair. And he um, is taping the show, and he will put it on YouTube. So my guest tonight is Dr. Sudhir Gad, who's a board-certified psychiatrist with a private practice in Union Square, New York. He's also a commander in the U.S. Navy Reserve and the medical director for the Center for Recovery and Wellness. After completing his undergraduate degree at NYU in New York City, Dr. Gad earned his medical degree at St. George's University Medical School. He did his residency at State University of New York at Stony Brook, where he received the Stevens Samak Award for Compassionate Care. Following residency, he worked as an attending at Bellevue Hospital Center and taught pharmacology at NYU School of Medicine. He's a member of the American Psychiatric Association and is also a psychiatrist at the New Life School for Special Needs Children in the Bronx. So, you know, thank you for being here tonight. We, I do appreciate it. Um, as you know, I, I wrote an article about your, you know, I found your work and I wrote an article about it, which was published last week in Neolife, about your work with lithium. And um, so why don't you give us a little bit of history of lithium, you know, what, what, what it was used for, what it's used for, you know, what it's you know, used for, what it's approved for, and, and how you're using it. Thank you, David. Uh, pleasure to be here and to talk with you all. And uh, yeah, history of lithium. I guess it, it uh, started the Big Bang. We can go that far back. But uh, why don't we start with the beginning of the medical usage of it, uh, which is what you're talking about. And I think the, the FDA is where we can start, even though, again, the, uh, the importance of lithium in medicine and history and food and beverage uh, and physics goes well before the 70s and the use of lithium for bipolar disorder, right? That's what we think of now when we think of lithium is bipolar disorder or batteries or nirvana, okay? Uh, so in terms of what it's used for, it's used for the treatment of bipolar disorder to reduce the occurrence of manic episodes and to reduce the uh, occurrence of suicidality. Right? It is the best treatment for bipolar disorder and perhaps severe persistent mental illness. Even there, it's underutilized, but that is what it is certainly approved for and as an augmentative agent in depression as well. Uh, it's recognized that it's useful and is you know, well published in that arena. Now, you know, in terms of history beyond, uh, lithium is present in the Earth's crust. It's in us all. It's in rocks. And it's in water, of course. So in areas where there is some lithium from the crust into aquifers, into springs, where it still exists, where it has always existed, those regions have lower rates of mental health issues. They're physically and mentally healthier. Lower rates of suicide, homicide, depression, Alzheimer's, psychosis. These are all replicated studies from around the world. Your audience is very savvy, I imagine. You can verify this. And so there is evidence on the micro scale of tiny amounts of lithium naturally present. And there's certainly evidence on the randomized controlled trials and epidemiologic evidence of, of the treatment of severe persistent mental illness on a higher dose side. And what I research and have you know, come to appreciate is the use well in the middle of that between the micro and between the bipolar dosing, which is known as low dose lithium. If your audience looks that up, that's what they should look up. So explain what is bipolar disorder? Because it is that, you know, it was originally called mania. Right. Originally called manic depressive illness. Okay. And so now we call it bipolar one, bipolar two, but the bipolar that we know of is bipolar one or manic depression. It's really the presence of a manic episode, which is many days, in fact, weeks, months even at times, of a disrupted mood, irritable or elated, impulsive, grandiose, fast talking, uh, activities that are out of character, speech that is very quick, uh, sleeplessness that goes on and on, decreased need for sleep. And this is not connected to any drug use. So when that occurs, 
and a person's mood leaves baseline and enters the stratosphere, they end up hospitalized frequently or are harming themselves because they've spent too much money or have traveled or you know, gotten involved in Ill, Ill thought of relationships or um, business relationships or are just naked in the, in the streets. You know? But it's a disruption. It is different from schizophrenia. And this was you know, theorized and seen and is still pretty accurate in terms of history in that schizophrenia is a downward spiral continuously from around you know, age 18 to 30, somewhere in there for men and women, whereas bipolar disorder is an up and down kind of course. There's recovery partially, and then there's, uh, you know, with adherence, there is control, there's no doubt, but there's frequent non-adherence. Uh, so that is, in a nutshell, what bipolar disorder is. And lithium, you know, was discovered as medicine for you know, when it was being used in Australia and uh, by a great physician named John Cade, C-A-D-E, you know, I think one of the most important physicians and certainly psychiatrists that, uh, uh, that I can say, uh, he looked at it in, in terms of how much is appropriate. And, and certainly, you know, with the technology that we have now, we knew back then he was overdosing many of the patients in the asylum setting in Western Australia, but his discovery was fine-tuned. And then, you know, here we are in the, the, the 50s in Europe when it was frequently used. And eventually by the FDA, it was stamped as, you know, appropriate. Uh, and it, you know, I think there was probably some distance between our pharmaceutical approaches through, you know, synthetic medicines and why there was such a delay. And that probably still is a factor, a major factor today. So it was approved by the FDA in 1970 for the treatment yeah. of acute mania. Right. And 1974 is the first approved treatment for prevention of recurrences in bipolar disorder. Um, and okay, so you you've talked about the mania. So what happens? So a person, you know, they become manic and then they they they, they go into a depression. Well, after the recovery of a yeah. manic episode. That is possible. And in fact, uh, possible in that immediately after, but more likely it will occur at some point. But the, you know, what's interesting is it's not just a depression, it's a crippling depression, it's a suicidal depression. In fact, amongst the causes of death for people with bipolar disorder, suicide is very high. In fact, suicide is the highest in that diagnosis group. So you know, we already have a suicide issue, and it's not because we have more bipolar disorder today. It's more connected to desperation, addiction, uh, and, and amplification of difficulties in, in economics and drug abuse, et cetera, that is worsening uh, mood and such. And, and you know, my, my path to why I chose and understood lithium to be as powerful as it is, it comes from the treatment of bipolar disorder and in Bellevue. I wouldn't have figured this out, I don't think, if I wasn't inundated with you know, illness in this revolving door system that we see even more now at a place like Bellevue. Um, so you, you know, you, you know, you, we, you know, you and I have talked, and um, and you said that it's a great treatment for unipolar depression, which is. You know, just normal depression. If, if, if there is a normal depression, and that's that's the depression where you go to a doctor, you go to your internist, go to a psychiatrist, no prescribed Zoloft or Prozac or the old drugs like Tofanil. Um, but traditionally, it's the SSRIs, Zoloft, Prozac, Celexa, and all these drugs, and they work half the time in people in teenagers. There's warnings about suicidal ideation, which means they, they, they see suicide as a way out. And, um, and also Paxil is one of the drugs. And these drugs, when they first came out, you know, they talked about, you know, there was a doctor in New York who advocated just throwing them in the water. And no one's advocating that anymore because of, the, of some of the problems. 
but you know the the solution is to you know they, they add on um atypical uh, drugs um which are often used to treat schizophrenia to help help the depression and that that, that has its own problems because these um these drugs can cause weight gain and um sedation and all kinds of side effects it can, it can cause heart problems and metabolic syndrome diabetes as well um so when did it, when did you think about treating um people with depression with low dose lithium well uh you know i i will answer that in 10 seconds but i, I just want to make sure that okay. i'm not a an anti psychiatry psychiatrist I'm not anti SSRIs or other okay. polypharmaceutical techniques that you know can be effective. Certainly, uh, I want to bridge. I want to bridge nature and nurture. I want to bridge uh, lithium understanding and synthetic psychiatry understanding. And I think we're we're strongest when we are combining approaches. Uh, I'm you know I, I don't I certainly don't want to put all of psychiatry or these medicines under a bust or anything. Uh, even though I think they're weak and I would not use them first line. Um, I can say that, but I can also say that they are safe, that they are perfectly, uh, you know, uh, acceptable, but I don't think they're better. So here's, here's the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I'm in Bellevue. I'm seeing one after the other of very, you know, uh, ill individuals. They don't have bipolar disorder, but they are trying to kill themselves in unique ways, right? Whether they're, uh, girls or boys who have had severe sexual trauma and are cutting themselves or are in addictive uh, situations and that's causing other psychiatric problems or they are in uh, extremely abusive relationships. They're commencing this slow motion suicide, as I call it, right? So I say to myself, look, if lithium works so well, it's documented to be so effective for suicidality, then imminent suicidality, and I need a certain level of that, why can't I use a similar amount, if not less, just slightly less maybe, because I don't want to give them too many side effects that would cause them to not take it, for these individuals who don't actually have a bipolar dis uh, disorder diagnosis. So I would begin to use sub-therapeutic dosing. So to give your audience an idea of what dosing usually is like, lithium carbonate, which is the pharmaceutical version, in a bipolar patient is usually dosed at 600 to 1200 milligrams a day, leading to a level of about 0.6 to 1.0 milligrams per deciliter. Now, when you're maintained outside, outpatient, and you're stable, that level is often brought down. They try to give them 0 0.5, 0 0.6 level, okay? So that's what I was going for inpatient. I started to give 450, 300 milligrams, 600 milligrams, two individuals who didn't, I knew they didn't have bipolar, but they were on many medicines and they weren't working or they'd been here many times. And I wanted to, to try something that I knew worked for more severity at just less. It was, it was a, it, it, it wasn't, you know, a lark. It, it had been done. I knew from other doctors that they did it in their careers. So I said, let's do this more. And that's when I found that it was effective. And it was enabling me to remove those antipsychotics that you mentioned, because they do cause significant side effects for people if they don't need them significantly, if they, don't, if they aren't acutely psychotic or you know, seriously non-responsive to other medicines, less is more. I, I, it, the typical antipsychotics are terrible long-term, they will cause irreversible movement problems. And the atypical ones not only can do that possibly, but they certainly cause metabolic issues uh, almost invariably. But there are now better ones that cause less of it, but not entirely free of them. So I started to use lithium. That was the way. And that's how it began me thinking, how low can I go? And what is the history of this? Once I found out that there was benefit of lithium in water to those regions, that 7-Up mm. was a... Bib label lithiated lemon lime soda that it was formulated with lithium. Then I said, now we're in you know territory that was never taught to me. I was pretty furious, and you know I'm an emotional guy. I'll tell you that, but it's hard to see 
people coming in that you try and help put together and then you fail and they fail when they leave. You know, even if they have housing and employment, the medicines are so uh, you know, Byzantine in the amounts and interactions, bags of medicines, they don't even know when they're taking them, is what I would see over and over. Benzodiazepine use, I had a big problem with that, I still do. It's a toxic medicine, rotting the brain, and yet it's one of the top three, four medicines prescribed in psychiatry. Alprazolam, clonazepam, uh, uh, you know, the sleep analogs of those medicines like uh, Zolpidem and such, right? So, so just, just to translate, to, you're talking about Xanax. Ambien, Xanax, Clonopin, yeah. yes. Oh, okay. uh, so that's why I, I started to say, you know, usually he, a lot of doctors would, would be like nat naturopathic or vitamins and things, they don't work. But then I saw a certain amount of this was working. Now, that doesn't mean I was going to tell my patient to go to Whole Foods, but I wanted to see and continue to investigate how low was appropriate and safe with lithium. And now I've concluded that certainly more study is important, but you can go very far with 150 milligrams of lithium carbonate. Uh, it is very effective. It is very powerful to prevent and treat depression, anxiety, dementia, improvement, uh, CTE, it, the, the array of conditions continues to pile on. And I'm not even the one doing this research. It's now coming from, you know, left and right uh, okay. internationally. So for, for my audience, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will get to them. Um, so I, want, I just wanted to, to read um, that lithium comes from grains, vegetables, mustard, kelp, dairy, fish, and meat, and is considered safe in small amounts. It is not regulated in drinking water. The United States Geographical Survey last year reported that about 45% of public supply wells and about 17% of US domestic supply wells have a concentration of lithium that could present a potential human health risk. Um, the most elevated lithium concentrations were measured in four aquifer systems in the Western United States, where 10 million people rely on groundwater for drinking water. So, um, and I guess that the concerns are the concerns of lithium are its effects on the kidneys, I guess, right? Yeah. Amongst other things, absolutely. Kidneys, thyroid, birth defects, skin issues, cardiac. Uh, yes, all of it. And yet those concerns are unfounded. In fact, it's the opposite, that those Western United States areas, specifically Big Bend, Texas, where this is from, this is third element water. You know, I found this water. It was in a Texas A&M study, mm -hmm. not a, you know, a school to sneeze at in terms of uh, agriculture and uh, engineering and intelligent individuals. Uh, that Baylor, Texas uh, University, et cetera, uh, and even schools in Germany combined on a study about areas of Big Bend with improved mental health risks in that region. And, and this has been replicated again, as I mentioned, around the world. So that's where we went and got some water from, carbonated it, and you know, just started to share it with uh, nightclub goers or wellness folks or fitness people here in New York. Uh, this went, it went just fine. I mean, the, the data doesn't indicate any risk. And I think what I'm trying to do isn't to create, you know, credibility suspicion with a product as well. It's to say we can be less scary and scared of this mineral because people think of lithium, they think of high dose zombification, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I take 150 milligrams of the pharmaceutical version every day. And as a result, there are many anti-aging benefits and anti-stress benefits that I get and recommended to a lot of my patients. That's where I started two of the last papers. And what, and what dose do you have to go for blood tests for kidney function? Things like that? Great question. So at the dose that I take 150 milligrams of lithium carbonate, which is prescription strength, it is undetectable in blood. Okay. It would be zero, the level. Now, where does it start showing up? 
probably between 300 and 450 milligrams a day, which is where I would certainly recommend blood testing. But even then, there's no array of risk that is akin to the kidney frying possibilities of 1,200 milligrams plus over many years. That's so where the danger zone is. But the, do but the dose you take has to be prescribed, correct? It does. So okay. there's the alternative uh, is the, the dose that's available online. All right. So to give you the elemental lithium amount, for example, the dose that I take is 27 milligrams of elemental lithium, approximately. The dose that you can get online without a prescription for pennies per pill is about one milligram of elemental lithium. The dose that is given to bipolar individuals is 200 milligrams. One, 27, 200. Huge range, right? And so as an essential trace element, yes, it is in those foods. It's in the Mediterranean diet heavily, nuts especially, oysters, caviar, broccoli, champagne has natural lithium in it. So this could be a very expensive diet, frankly. Uh, but I think that to supplement, because this is not in any multivitamin, it's no longer in our soil as much as it is in very special areas because of soil erosion and such, nor is it in water. I think that 45% is, you know, I'd have to verify that, but it's, 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 uh, in the geologic surveys that I've seen in, the, in that paper, uh, it's, it's far gone from the areas where it used to be. Um, so, so the dose, so, but people who are drink, drinking lithium you know, infused water, they're not drinking it because they're depressed, right? No, I think that, you know, this is not intended as a product to treat depression. It is a product to enhance wellness and to okay. help you know, someone understand that this is not something scary. Uh, and it does, however, have anti-inflammatory benefits, but it's very dialed down, obviously. It's kind of like taking iron supplement over the counter or, you know, uh, something more prescribed. Well, uh, I, know, I know people who don't have diabetes are taking metformin because um, it's supposed to, you know, be good for brain health as well as your heart. Um, as well as you know, longevity. And there's also a um, diabetes drug, another diabetes drug that people are taking for weight loss. And right, Ozempic and, and its cousin. And again, metformin is as an anti-inflammatory, right. where you're talking about all these systems. And I think in mind, body, this is, it sounds hokey, right, at times, but this is, a, we are connected entirely. The fact that we practice medicine in silos and don't understand much about nutritional, dental, podiatry, or even other organ systems, it's you know, a bunch of blind men in a room with an elephant at times. So you know, metformin is a great example of an anti-inflammatory medication repurposed now for preventative measures. And that's where I think something as accessible as lithium could also be talked about, researched more, because it's coming. All of this is it's in the ether right now, and it's being studied by NIH. It's being uh, you know, studied by Alzheimer's uh, foundations. Uh, and you know, I can tell you about the two studies, the last one on COVID, which again is in part of the, the title of this topic, that's, that's probably the best study I've been associated with um, that I think should really be talked about. Why don't you, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Okay. So in short, I worked with a team in Spain, uh, the Galencia Sur Institute, one of the top national health Spanish hospitals in the north of Spain, and MIT. All right. So and me. Okay. So I, I did it because I was already speaking and working with some researchers on this concept. I was using it at my CRW facility, which we can talk about for a moment. Uh, addiction treatment facility downtown. And right now I'm in uh, the Upper East Side. So in that study, we, it was very elegant. We had two groups, about two dozen in each group, randomized control trial, hospitalized patients with severe COVID. They're hospitalized. Their saturation rates at the beginning of the pandemic, this is again, pre-vaccine, their saturation rates was, were below 93%, both groups getting standard treatment of steroids, antivirals, 
supine treatment, oxygen, the works. One group got lithium, and the amount that they got was 300, then 600, then 900 milligrams per day. The other group got none of it. Okay. What we saw was that the group that got lithium, all of them were discharged in a week. The other group, not so much. But the more miraculous, the other group, two of them died. A couple went to the ICU. Some still have long COVID. And it was a much longer hospital stay, four times as long, technically. But beyond the remarkable clinical statistics that that is, were this cytokine statistics. Now, you know, everyone knows now about this term, the cytokine storm, right? And how when our bodies are activated, you can think of cytokines as the, the red and green lights of a traffic system. If there are too many green lights, we're going to have crashes. There's going to be chaos. So it needs to have balance mm -hmm. in terms of the mitigation of the flow of immune cells, of neurologic impulses, of blood flow, et cetera, all of it. And with something like COVID into pre-inflamed bodies, it was setting off alarms and causing a flooding of these uh, immune chemicals and cytokines into the body. Therefore, the lungs were filled with fluid and there was just nothing that could be done to save individuals. Uh, they were drowning in their own fluid. So it was, it was like they were killing themselves in sorts. Now, the cytokines of all 18 that we measured were not sufficiently different in the control group, but with the lithium group, every time we dosed a new amount of lithium, 300, 600, 900, there was an equal reduction in almost every cytokine that we measured. So it mitigated it. It's not anti-inflammatory. It's inflammation adjusting. So I have a basic question from someone um, listening in saying, what, what are the long-term effects of the body with, re with regular lithium use? At the right dose, which is again, low dose and lower, nothing except better health. The long-term effects are a reduction in an enzyme called GSK3, which is a brain aging enzyme. So we only get benefits. The latest paper, in fact, from three months ago was written from folks in Canada. Again, national health system, no pharma money there, right? No pharma money in me or the, the paper that I did, but that Canadian paper talked about multiple physical system benefits, sarcopenia, muscle loss, adjusting that, neurotrophic factors, uh, cardiotrophic factors. So it keeps balance longer. You know, on, on a simple level, lithium is a conductor of electricity. It's in your battery of this phone that we're talking on, this laptop. The brain is electrical. We are energetic beings. We are beings of energy. Balance here, up and down, inside out, means balance downstream as well. So the long-term negative effects of lithium really occur at doses that are high even for bipolar patients, even bipolar patients, they have been studied at 600 milligrams a day. Their brains are actually bigger than bipolar patients who have not been prescribed lithium. So it doesn't hurt them even. Even uh, this is about you know continually. You know again, science has no definitive answers. I'm not trying to give a definitive answer. I'm just showing. There's a hell of a lot of association here and we should not ignore it. Just like fluoride and iodine, we should be looking at trace elements like lithium that can assist human health and the pharma industry. You know, fluoride didn't put dentists out of business. No, they didn't. Um, I guess so, it must be frustrating to you that we, you, you, we have a drug, lithium, which you know can be prescribed for depression, but people aren't prescribing for depression. If you go to your internist, they would just and say, I would like to take lithium. They would say, you're crazy. Um, um, a, a psychiatrist probably would say, well, let's try Zoloft and, or Prozac first, which yes. is, you know, which, which has, you know, they do work for you know, some people very well. Um, and for some people, they don't, obviously. But, um, 
So in lithium, I mean, you must have people who don't respond, who are depressed, who don't respond to it, correct? Absolutely. It is not a panacea. Okay. It is a panauxilia. I, that's what I, I made that word up. Okay. It means it helps everything a little bit. And sometimes we need extra help. Sometimes those individuals have a, you know, a different condition that we need combination treatment with. I can't treat ADHD that well with lithium. Okay. But uh, nor can I treat psychosis primarily only with lithium, uh, mm -hmm. nor can I treat, you know, severe alcohol withdrawal with only lithium. You know, this is not my uh, interest. So I think that you're right on the first part. A lot of doctors, the, the, the toughest customers I have and the people that I talk with are doctors, but it's getting easier when I have more and more credible papers and evidence to show them and share with them that are not industry funded. So I think there's gonna be more collaboration between this you know, naturopathic arm of medicine and nutraceutical and, and you know, earth and, and man, more or less, right? Well, people spend billions on vitamins. Um, so, um, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I see lithium, um, you know, when I look at uh, Walgreens or CVS, and they have vitamins, they have magnesium and B12 and these things, but I'm not sure it's with lithium. But I get one question I have is, I, I did look at the Amazon website and there's lots of supplements for lithium. Yeah. And one question I have is that, how do you know what you, you know, it's, these are not FDA regulated products because the FDA is not, either is central, you know, the FDA has no authority over vitamins. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, you can take, you know, I mean, they, I think New York State did a study of vitamins they found a lot, or just supplements, and they found a lot of times they really didn't have what they said they had, and also they had some things that were not so good for you. So if a person is depressed, you, rec you recommend them going, you know, getting first prescription lithium, but not just saying, I'm going to try for myself. I'm going to go, I'm going to order and think, I'm going to order lithium on Amazon and just try for myself because they have no idea what's a dose, right? They don't, but all of the ones available that you're describing are mm -hmm. one milligram of element to lithium or 20 milligrams approximately of lithium car, excuse me, or rotate. Lithium right. or rotate is the one that you're going to find online. And all of those are one milligram of elemental lithium or less. So they're super safe if you're taking one a day. Right. Uh, even two a day, hell. But they're also unreliable, as you mentioned. So that's the conundrum. But it's also a gateway to them saying, okay, this didn't hurt me. You, know, you could buy lithiated water. You could go on Third Element, you know, my website, and buy the lithiated water. Or from another place in uh, called Happy Water in Canada. In fact, a, a Chinese company sells it. They are gangbusters over there in China. Uh, there's a company in... Uh, Athens, Georgia, that sells it, but they're all very low. It's just about helping someone realize, okay, this is not hurting me. Maybe I can ask my NP, my doctor, my PA to write a micro amount, you know, at the pharmacy because that would be cheaper than the than the uh, vitamins and certainly pure because that's regulated. So part of it is a you know a gateway uh, approach that you don't have to be afraid of this. It's okay to take in, in the nutraceutical amounts. And that's also why I came up with my own powdered version because I knew what was going in it. I went to a company in Minnesota. I said, formulate me something that some of my patients who do not want to take the uh, prescribed version that I can share with them, that I can offer them. Um, so I want to go back to, you know, um, saying that the Greek founder of modern medicine, Galen, recommended a lo local lithiated spring to all his patients. And as, real, as recently as 100 years ago, visiting such springs in the United States was very common. Yes. Um, do people, do people go, can you go to a lithiated spring? Can you go to a spring? You, you can. Where they are, are, are they? Uh, I, I struck, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people go to springs in New Mexico, for example. I spoke with a bartender once who grew up next to one went there like they were public pools, right? Mm -hmm. And look, we're seeing the lithium mining industry take off. That has its own uh, environmental effects. But, you know, again, wherever it's present in small amounts, 
uh, those regions, they're not, you know, th there's no, uh, there's no Soho house there, but uh, give it time, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, th there's certainly a place called Athens, Georgia, where that spring is still there. Saratoga Springs got its name from there being lithiated water there. Bear Lithia Water was one of the first up north in, in New York, but Coca-Cola came along and it's changed. Baden-Baden, so, Baden, Germany, et cetera. Yeah. I can go on. So what, what's, the, what's the difference between, you know, so like you said, they're lithium batteries. So and what's, what's their relation to, the relation to the lithium that people take for, as an ingestion? Lithium chloride yeah. uh, is an entirely different animal that, you know, you don't want to take the, you know, the, the battery acid version, obviously. Don't no. do that. That is, that's, that's going to burn a hole through you. Right. And we've seen how flammable they are, right? Lithium is not innocuous. It is powerful. No. It, it set fires. It is setting fires on these electric scooters that are being charged and overheated and, you know, in buildings all around New York right now. Um, you know, before Tesla got their act together, which is a constant process, apparently, uh, their cars were blowing up, right? Our phones, same thing. Uh, the, the vapes, it's explosive. And this also is interesting because, you know, physicists have looked at lithium from a different angle. It's, it's such poetry to me that I was never told as a psychiatrist in training, hey, did you know there's hydrogen, helium, lithium? It's the first solid. It's the first metal. It ignited the Big Bang. It is really the dust that we start from. Uh, I would have had a different view of it. I would have differently, uh, I would have definitely not been as afraid as I started with it, you know, that it's in our textbooks. This is only for these people at this dosage level. Otherwise it is dangerous. Be careful. you got to monitor this. That's annoying. You have to, you know, I mean, with doctors, we got so much to do, so much, so many things to educate and convince people to try and do for themselves. It's hard to then add, oh, by the way, I'm going to give you a medicine that you're going to possibly burn your kidneys out with, be on dialysis with, you know, and uh, cause fetal malformations, et cetera. They're not going to take this. So that's why I wanted to see, is that only at that place? Because it, on the low dose spectrum, none of that is true. Now, for, for people who are on lithium, um, their doses can be adjusted. It's, it's one of the few... Um, drugs used to treat uh, mental illness that can be measured in the blood. Correct. And then you can make adjustments based on what the blood levels are. You can, but I think a, you know, a wise mentor of mine once said, we're treating a patient, not the number, not the lab, not the measurement. And so for anyone on it, you know, I'd first, a lot of folks have come to me and said, or publicly said, hey, listen, this is not as effective as you think. I've been on this. It's very dangerous. Uh, and I would tell those people, you may be on more than you should be on. Mm -hmm. And in the past, when I see a patient too, who's, who comes to me and I, and I say lithium and they say, oh, I've tried that. No, thanks. I would tell them, this is not that. I'm not going to give you anything that needs the kind of monitoring that you've had before, nor will you even feel it in a negative way. This, you know, for those people on it, I would say, consider less actually, and consider the less of the other medicines you may be on and more of behaviors related to diet, exercise, sleep, hygiene, connection, less screen time, you know, purpose, pleasure, but it, it's not always more is better. Okay. For those listening, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and a box. Um, and I'll, I'll get to them. Um, so you say you, you take uh, 150 milligrams a day. Yes. And when did you start taking that? You know, I started taking it when I was, oh my God, it's been a few years that I started taking it intermittently. Mm -hmm. And then I had two kids, uh, you know, one after the other, and mm -hmm. uh, things got a little bit more stressful, and my sleep was not as uh, deep and regimented, right? So, you know, I, I just said, I got to. I've got to enhance myself naturally. And if I'm talking about this for patients as regularly, I want to be able to say that I take this every day too. So 
I started taking it probably about two years ago um, when, you know, my wife and I were considering a second child. And since then, now we have a you know, son and daughter, God bless. And what it does for me is that, you know, I know that I've got a little bit of wind at my back, but more pragmatically, I dream more vividly and readily, even if I've had a glass of wine or two. Okay, so it protects me from that. It ensures that I have REM sleep and deep sleep. And since I, I work out frequently as well, I want that kind of anti-inflammatory to speed up and reduce soreness, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it keeps me as sharp as I need to be from a.m. to late as possible. So we have a question. Um, how do you know that it's not addictive? Well, there's no withdrawal, that's for one. You know, I think something that is addictive will give you not just a high, uh, it'll be reward inducing, but a tolerance will develop and there will be withdrawal, right? Those are the kind of the tenets of mm -hmm. addictive components. You know, you're not gonna feel intoxicated on lithium. You're just gonna feel happier, lighter. That's not a bad thing, you know, but it's not a high. I have, you know, I understand what the cannabis high is. Uh, it's not that. And so there's, you know, there's no harm in stopping it, except the fact that the people who have susceptibility to either seasonal depression or you know, premenstrual or, or, you know, um, anxiety conditions or who have trauma, this is such an important medicine for people who've had trauma or have susceptibility for dementias and cancers that, you know, there could be a risk readjustment when stopping it. I mean, people who have anxiety that I've given this to, friends, for example, uh, um, prescribed this to, they talk about improvement and then they talk about how the stoppage of it caused some insomnia to return. So that's not necessarily addiction to me. That is, you're getting a benefit mm -hmm. just like you would get from you know, iron supplementation, and then you might get tired if you didn't take that. Hmm. Does it affect dopamine levels? It does. It affects every neurotransmitter. How does, how does it affect dopamine levels? You know, that question is for probably more research and a better mind, but I do know that GSK3, you know, in the past, we would talk about second messenger systems, right? IMP3, GSK3 wasn't even on the map when I was learning about this, but now we have more data to show that and i can now even with our cytokine connected study we can see that it is anti-inflammatory and gsk3 is that enzyme that cuts down neural connections as we age it suspends it reduces that enzyme so you are holding on to neural neuronal cells you're not necessarily growing brain but you're not eroding brain as much. So, so as, all neurotransmitter levels are increased. So as you know, last week, there was a clinical trials of Alzheimer's disease meeting and um, <clears throat> a company presented data of you know, a new drug that um, yep. actually seemed to um, prevent cognitive, actually you know, prevented cognitive decline and got rid of plaques. But the drug is, you know, very expensive. I mean, the same the same drug that was um, there was a drug approved last year, the first drug approved since two thousand three, and then Medicare wouldn't pay for it. They said that there was there was no benefit, and there also maybe, um, you know, and um, so it, you said it's being looked at for Alzheimer's disease. It is, and there was a study that was. You know, this is how disappointing and corrupt, potentially, I'll say that C word, uh, our healthcare and you know, political system and media system are entwined. Because before that study, that was so underwhelming, by the way, the, mm -hmm. new, the new drug that, yes, cost thousands of dollars and only provided more risk. Doctors in the New York Times article said, I would not recommend this. It's all risk and barely any benefit. Uh, five, the, people, there's five, an art five people died in the trial. Yeah. yeah, 
And, and there's an article today in this Science Times right here on flooding brains, washing them with ApoE2 to offset ApoE4 alleles. Mm. So, you know, that increases your risk a great deal. And so they're gene swapping, right? Uh, God knows how much that's going to cost. But there was, a, there was a trial, look this up too, low-dose lithium Alzheimer's, an RCT trial showing... Okay, randomized clinical... Yes, randomized clinical trial showing market benefits. I mean, the amount that that showed were 10x higher than what we saw in the recent clinical trial and no safety problems at all with 150 to 300 milligram dosing. So you know, I tell people as a preventative effect, great idea. I tell people as when it's already occurred, to reduce the likelihood of us accelerating this person's decline with multiple antipsychotics, uh, Haldol as well, you know, or medicines that don't even work that cost thousands, right? Lamantine, Nemenda, Aricept. It, it gives us more time. It prevents more problems so that we can, you know, add some of the holistic components this is being studied more, and I'm, I'm connected with the uh, Caring Kinds Foundation uh, to hopefully do our own replicated trial of this using sleep modification, you know, so we can look at sleep patterns in Alzheimer's and see the benefits because, um, you know, that's another place that I think it's connected to. Okay. So here's a question. I take Concerta for ADHD. Is it safe to take lithium with it? Very safe. In fact, a lot of my patients are on both a stimulant and low-dose lithium. And the reason I tell them it's a good idea is because, you know, not only when I tell people about ADHD and very few people actually get remission from ADHD after they've had it as a kid, it's harder than ever to not have ADHD, frankly, because we are under so much demand and stress and these devices accelerated to some degree. But I tell them, you're going to have to practice ADHD treatment with pills and skills. All right. So that means sleep hygiene, exercise, three liters of water, you know, as vegetarian as you can go, organize, connect with friends, blah, 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 et cetera, all that. But lithium addition will be like motor oil to this turbocharger. You need to protect your brain and ensure that you're going to get decent sleep at night because the opposite is what you know people use clonabit or god knows what for then then you're then you're doing damage at night and you're turbocharging your brain in the morning so we want to protect the engine we want to protect the brain with lithium so that you can push it forward with a stimulant well drugs like clonopin and ambien and all these drugs they also relax the throat muscles which causes people to snore more which you know and also you know, increase the risk of sleep apnea. Um, for the person who asked the question about ADHD, um, you're not his doctor, so he, he should talk to his doctor, obviously, right? Absolutely. And, and again, if that person looks up low-dose lithium and sees and does their due diligence, looks at a few links and says, Doc, you know, what do you think of either adding this? This is some evidence. Um, I, I think that doctor might be more mm -hmm. amenable. And he said, I also take quetiapine at night. And I don't, it's a drug I don't Right. Know. So you see, this is, this is one of the issues that when you're taking quetiapine or Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic, even right. if you're taking small amounts of that, that can cause metabolic or hormonal issues. So it can actually increase your appetite. Mm -hmm. And the sleep architecture from Seroquel is going to look very different than something natural like low dose lithium. So I've had great benefit in. And my patients as well, right? To okay. to swap them out to say, I'm going to add this low dose lithium. Hopefully, you'll be able sooner than you think to reduce and stop the seroquel. That way, you don't continue to sort of get puffier. As men, their their chests change. Mm -hmm. uh, they they gain a little few extra pounds sometimes with high doses of seroquel or olanzapine or risperdal or et cetera or Abilify. They'll gain a lot of weight, and then you've got multiple problems that go along with that. Talk about sleep apnea. Okay, but the recommendation for all individuals who are on other drugs is to 
get a prescription dose of lithium and speak to their doctor. In the reverse order, yes. Yeah, yeah reverse. It. Speak to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. That's fine. Um, so yeah, I mean, having, having two, you know, I have two children who are now adults who have their own children, and they tell me they they said, "Why didn't you tell me it was so hard?" And it's like it's because well, until you're sleep deprived, you don't really know that. Um, but and you can't really, you know, tell a person that. But um, there are a lot of good joys that come with it. Um, are you worried about the fact that um, these drugs are so easy to get over the counter with him that the person could say, I'm just going to, I don't care. I'm going I'm to take more than one milligram. I'm going to take 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams. I mean, yeah, I think the, the amount that would be necessary for, to, for someone to really do harm to themselves Right. is a great deal on those medicines. And frankly, you know, if you really want to harm yourself, Tylenol, okay, that is the number one overdosable drug and it's everywhere. You know, people, doctors have told me, I'm concerned about giving someone lithium because of the overdose potential. Right. And I say, guys, this reduces the risk of suicidality and self-harm. And by the way, treating ADHD in someone who's had even cocaine abuse or criminality or addiction of different kinds. If they have ADHD, if they've been screened for it, if they've taken tests for it, an ASRS scale from Harvard, you're actually going to treat their underlying learning disability to help them earn money the legal way. That will give them pride. That will reduce addiction and criminality risk. So it's a backdoor approach. And in terms of toxicity, I'm not worried about it. The lithium overdose is more or less mythologic. When you look this up as to how frequently this happens and, and leads to death, it is, it's on the level of uh, scan, you know, New York Public Library searches, you know, the, those, uh, those reels that you'd have to go back to. You know, it's, it's that ancient that someone in a case file would take a lot of lithium with multiple other medicines and that would lead to, you know, severe kidney failure and, and possible death. But there were very few. So I'm not worried about someone overdosing by taking too much. But I don't recommend you do that. Don't, you know, th that's silly. You're wasting your money more than anything else. Well, you can take Talk to your doctor. You can take as much vitamin C as you want. But, you know, it's not, it's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it'll upset your stomach. So, so a friend of mine said, you know, I take vitamin C, it upsets my stomach. I said, you know, it's called ascorbic acid. <laughs> so, you shouldn't be so shocked um balance but, is key you know i think yeah. so people should talk with their doctor who hopefully will have an open mind about something like this um but i think the more people you know build a movement on it uh you know they can't all call me but i'm, I'm still you know uh doing this and talking to people from around the world about it are you going to write a book about lithium uh I may have to, but I think I'd like to talk about other things. I mean, okay. you know, uh, probably the, you know, I'm very inspired by someone like Siddhartha Mukherjee. He would be wonderful if you can get him on this program. Uh, he's really recently written another book about the cell, right? The song of the cell. And, and he yeah, talks he's about- not, He's actually speaking about this book tonight with the, um, and I was invited to it. So I said, well, I can't. Really fun oh, well, thank you he, for talking to me instead. He's in there. Uh, yeah, well. Inspiring um, guy. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I'd like to connect it to what's going on on a macro scale politically here. Mm -hmm. The thing I talk about more is campaign finance reform, because I this is hard for me to do this. Even if we put lithium in the water, if people don't have economic security, if they don't have a cushion against the inflation, uh, if our leaders are really only interested in profits and not people, if they're only asking for campaign donations, if not talking to each other, we're, we're against the wind here. So, but, you know, I'm not going to diver so, okay, diverge so, too much into that. So we're, 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 we'll put your website um, in our, uh, on our website, we'll put it, we'll put, we'll put where people can find more information about you and also the research. Um, where can people go to find more information about lithium in general? Well, they can go very, uh, if on the nutritional end, they can get a one-stop shop at thirdelementwater.com. 
okay. that is, you know, by all disclosure, my business, but there are many places that you can get lithium from. I do not have a monopoly on this. So, you know, it's not like I have some special plant and that the only, you know, lithium comes from that or anything like that. So they can get the information. We have a great research page from around the world on that. They can Google it, you know, they can Google low dose lithium, nutritional lithium. Uh, and it's, it's literally all there now, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm knocked off the top five and I'm proud that I was doing this many years ago and more and more people, uh, Dr. Greenblatt at Tufts university, that's Ivy league, you know, up in Boston talks about this a great deal. So it, it is growing in momentum to, you know, see this as part of our diet. It's good for you in small amounts. Uh, it can enhance treatment of very severe conditions, God forbid we get them. There's articles about lithium and, and COVID, HIV, cancer, uh, autoimmune conditions, seborrheic dermatitis, um, CTE. It's all there mm. in terms of research and theories and even small case studies and findings. Okay, so I think we're, we're coming to the end. Um, I want to thank everyone for listening in. I know that uh, we're not going to do any more in December because everyone told me they're going holiday shopping or going to holiday parties and just be careful because a friend of mine just went to a holiday party and got COVID. So, um, but anyway, so everyone out there be safe. And Dr. God, this was fascinating. I appreciate you uh, spending more time with me because we talked, you know, from my, from the article I did as well. I just found it so fascinating. I said, I got to you know, put you on my show. So, um, and I want to thank Joe for uh, doing the taping. Um, we're going to we're going to put this um, out on you, our YouTube channel tomorrow for, for people who miss it. So um, and Joe just put in the um, webinar chat some of the websites. And um, we'll put that on our website, too, because you know, not everyone's listening to that. So anyway, Dr. Guy, thank you so much for spending time with us and our audience. I really appreciate it. And um, thanks, everyone, the audience for your questions. And our first scheduled thing in January is actually how to get published. And we're gonna have um, editors from Wired Magazine, the New York Times, and we're gonna have a book agent, we're gonna have a literary agent, and we're gonna have a professor of journalism, and they're all gonna speak about how you can get published and uh, not get, you know, go out of your mind, you know, not get frustrated. And um, so, Awesome. We're a writing group, so people are interested in getting published. So anyway, again, thank you, Dr. God. It's wonderful and uh, thank you. Fasc fascinating. And everyone out there, good night. Uh, stay safe and uh, happy holidays. Okay, um, take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys.